discussion. Hey, this is Brandon with Cairo. We have the ending to the shoulder um, uh, seminar with adhesive capsulitis. Probably one of my favorite yet <laughs> uh, worst diagnoses that can walk in my office. And the reason it's my favorite diagnosis because when we start to treat these patients, you really can um, peel back all the layers of the onion that, that led to this diagnosis. I Meaning you can go through years of dysfunction, years of uh, postures and, and, and workstation ergonomics and sports that have ultimately created this problem. So you can learn a lot about a patient um, when it comes to the shoulder. Um, and I think that this becomes a little more fun once they start to thaw out on all the interventions you can make and help these people uh, prevent it from happening again. But hopefully by the end of this conversation, we can really look at all those individual pieces and really help these people in the long run because a lot of people with adhesive capsulitis will get it again. There's a couple components to that. One are the lifestyle um, things that you can do uh, to create this problem and also are the systemic type issues that we can hopefully prevent to limit the, the reoccurrence uh, of frozen shoulder. So diving into frozen shoulder, most people look at it as adhesive capsulitis as far as uh, the professionals. However, um, you know, in, or adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder is what the uh, patients will often describe it as. And this is an ongoing, it's, it's it's a painful limitation of active and even passive ranges of motion. So we're going to see this very frequently with a rotator cuff problem. Someone doesn't want to move their arm. Um, and, and impingement syndrome and slap lesions and rotator cuff syndrome, they just don't want to do it. But passively, I can still do it. I can still passively take that arm into full flexion and abduction. With adhesive capsulitis, they can't. It's just not even available to them, that range of motion. So not only is the glenohumeral joint not moving, what we're also going to see is if it's been there long enough, we also see limitation in range of motion uh, into the periscapular areas, uh, into the scapula, into the rotator cuff muscles. They've really become tight um, and that, that range of motion is often lost. Whereas with impingement syndrome and labral lesions and rotator cuff syndromes, we see a lot of limitations in internal rotation. With adhesive capsulitis, we're also going to see limitations in internal rotation, but we're going to see the hallmark thing being a loss of external rotation. Now that is a site of confusion and we will address that in the next couple of slides is that that loss of external rotation is twofold. One, it can be due to the capsule limiting external rotation, which we're going to see with adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder, but also it's a possible uh, limitation in external rotation due to that subscapularis. So someone with a rotator cuff problem that's been there a long period of time, they have a really tight internal rotator being the subscapularis because it's doing a job it shouldn't be doing and you uh, lose external rotation. So I'll show you a quick way to assess that uh, because some people might get lulled into thinking they have adhesive capsulitis and they, they're stuck with a frozen shoulder, a pseudo frozen shoulder, but in actuality, it's just a problem with their subscapularis. I see this a lot on the internet where somebody will fix frozen shoulder in three minutes. Um, that's, that's great that you uh, helped with their, their limitation and range of motion, but that wasn't frozen shoulder. You had the wrong diagnosis. If you have a true frozen shoulder, you have actual fibrosis and neurogenesis, blood vessel ingrowth, nerve ingrowth. You have swelling of the capsule, synovitis. That doesn't go away within minutes. Uh, so a true adhesive capsulitis will take a while to present and will take a while to go away. And by a while, I mean weeks to months, sometimes years. And there's other things at play, not just a magical manipulation or myofascial release. If you do something and you see uh, you know, resolution or range of motion, great. The patient's excited. I'm excited for the patient, but it wasn't adhesive capsulitis to begin with. So what is it? What is primary adhesive capsulitis? And this is when you have a gradual onset of pain and stiffness that just can't be explained. It's not explained by their history or clinical findings. It just started, but it's a mystery on why it started. Most of the time, this is going to be in our older individuals, and I'll explain the specific subset of patients that will get primary adhesive capsulitis. 
This is a little bit more common that we're going to see in our offices for a couple of reasons. And this is when you have uh, an unrelated, you know, a shoulder immobilization uh, due to a surgery, due to a trauma, due to a fracture. For some reason, you immobilize a shoulder. When you do that, those patients are five to nine times more likely to experience adhesocapsulitis. Your bodies want you to move. You, you have to move. That's, it's healthy for your bodies to move and bear load. And when you have restricted range of motion due to any one of these causes, it causes an issue. So our symptoms are a progressive pain, uh, most focal to the actual the insertion at the deltoid and very, very sharp when you get to the range of motion, end range of motion. That end range used to be way out here. Now they can really just pick their arm up just a little bit and it's a really sharp and uncomfortable feeling. Uh, a lot of times people will say, hey, back off, let this thing unthaw by itself, let, let it take its course of action. And I don't know if that's the worst um, option, uh, but personally, theoretically, principle-based uh, reasoning would say that, yes, that's true, but we need to start the process. We need to influence motion because the body is designed to move. And I'm not telling you uh, to take the person into sharp pain and you know yank at their arm. However, even if they have a fully frozen shoulder and it's secondary adhesive capsulitis and we know what it is, I'm still going to be working with that patient to work on maybe scapular motion, work on neck motion, work on thoracic spine motion, uh, getting the body moving. Because what we do know is that we have a segment of your body that's not moving, other things have to move more. And that compensatory motion sometimes is just as bad or just as painful as the primary problem. So something to, to think about. Now, uh, I think that, uh, in, in my opinion, one of the things that gets confused with frozen shoulder is just this. So if we have a loss of internal rotation, so if I'm off to my side and I bring my arm down, this would be internal rotation. That's not great. I did a lot of overhead sports in my life. I can maybe get 45 degrees. It's not, 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 not good at all, but there's, there's reasons behind that. Uh, just like all of our patients have reasons. However, if I have a loss of internal rotation, I could have just hypertonicity in my teres minor, my infraspinatus, uh, my, my subscapularis, or I'm sorry, supraspinatus. Uh, this is a very common problem with labral lesions and rotator cuff problems and impingement syndrome. However, when you have a loss of external rotation, that should be a light bulb moment in your practice because this is telling you something a little more significant is going on. One being a problem with the capsule, which would be more indicative of a frozen shoulder, and the other one would be a problem with the subscapularis, indicative of impeding, you know, some, some, impending a frozen shoulder or just a, a rotator cuff problem with the subscapularis. Remember, if you have weakness in one of the rotator cuff muscles, most commonly the one on top, the supraspinatus, the subscapularis has to work harder to move that glenohumeral joint down. Uh, so it becomes hypertonic. It's doing a job it isn't designed to do. So if you keep your arm, and I'm going to lower this down just a little bit. Um, I'm going to lower it down even a little bit more here. And it's down here at zero degrees, and my arm's at 90 degrees. If I try to move my arm out into external rotation, that's about as far as I can go, maybe about 90 degrees if you go from this side. Uh, not, 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 not great, but um, like I said, I, I do have a labor problem on the right side. Um, so I do have a little hypertonicity, and I'm a chiropractor, so I have shoulder dysfunction by default. Um, so that would be more, uh, if I had a limitation in range of motion, let's say you're looking at me right here, and I only go to 45 degrees, that's not great. There's a problem with my subscapularis uh, probably. Now, if you want to get away from that and you abduct the arm 45 degrees, so I abduct it out to 45 degrees, now I'm dependent more on the capsule for range of motion. So at 45 degrees, now I try to externally rotate and I can't. That's indicative of more of a capsular issue and not a subscapularis issue. So once again, at zero degrees, if I can't actually rotate my arm, subscapularis. If I can't actually rotate my arm when I'm out here, then that'd be more of a frozen shoulder. And that may seem like a small little nuance as it is. However, this could be the difference between solving someone's shoulder pain within two to four weeks and one year. So subscapularis issues are much easier to treat as compared to uh, capsule issues. So in this precursor phase, we really need to decide what's causing the limitation in range of motion because uh, glenohumeral joints that are undergoing the 
this diffuse synovial inflammatory reaction uh, that we're going to see with uh, problems in our capsule, meaning at 45 degrees, unable to externally rotate their arm. That is a systemic problem. That's something that we need to, uh, to take a look at why that's happening and to fix the, uh, the offending causes. If it's just a subscapular issue, I'm going to get my thumb in there and I'm going to rough it up. I'm going to do some strengthening exercises for the other muscles and the external rotators. I'm going to work on mobilizing the scap or whatever it may be because a subscapularis issue is nothing more than a rotator cuff issue. Um, so uh, that, that's a little more uh, you know, treatable. Phase two is a very painful process. I have never been through it in my life. This is just going based off of what I hear in my practice. However, this is a gradual loss of range of motion uh, over the next couple of weeks to months. And this is a proliferative synovitis. This is a, a problem that uh, causes uh, you know, angiogenesis, nerve growth, neurogenesis, where uh, nerves and blood vessels are growing into this area and are increasing the, the pain response to this area. But it's often likely due to a systemic response. What we see now is it's, the, it's not the seed, it's the soil. It's, it's the, the people in today's world have a, a diet and a lifestyle that's a little bit more pro-inflammatory. So these people are uh, susceptible to the phase two uh, freezing stage of a frozen shoulder. <laughs> Once we hit uh, you know, phase three, I do have a, uh, what is she now? She's 10 years old. So she was right there in the middle of the frozen stage or frozen movie when it first came out. And I can still sing every word to this song as embarrassing as it is. Uh, but frozen stage is one of those pieces that when it's lost, it's lost. It's really not inflamed at that point, meaning it's not constantly hurting. It's just there. Uh, they're not able to go through range of motion. That fibrosis, that capsular thickening, uh, the adhesions that are built up because of the layers of muscles and ligaments have adhesed together. We see uh, sometimes some inflammation, the subacromial bursa. Uh, we just see everything is not moving very well, not really moving at all. Uh, this prolonged immobilization can really be detrimental to the shoulder though, just like we know with every other part of the body, when you immobilize a joint, everything around it gets uh, atrophy, degenerated much at a faster, much faster rate, um, and we can actually experience permanent uh, motion restriction. So this is a stage, um, I'm not going to take a sledgehammer to it to get it moving, but I also want to keep in my mind that I need to get it moving. Once they've gone out of this stage, the phase two, and once we've gotten into this stage where it's not hurting as much, it's not inflamed, that's when I need to get some work done. And by work, I mean I need to, to, to start to uh, progressively increasing the load, increasing the range of motion, uh, so I can start to get this thing to, in essence, thaw out. Uh, this is not a quick process. I, I, I will admit that I don't see a lot of uh, frozen shoulder cases in my office anymore. And the reason is because I work with a physical therapist office that does a great job of this. And it's not that I don't like treating it and I still see the patients frequently for neck pain and upper back pain and scapular issues. Um, however, I have the physical therapist manage these cases because it just takes too long. I have a practice that is based upon getting people in and out of pain as fast as possible. And this diagnosis just doesn't fit into my brand of what I do in my practice. Um, so I'm not um, you know, someone that is best suited to treat these just because of the way I, I run my office. There's another component though. There's another piece of this puzzle that I farm out. And the reason I do that is because I am not a dietary kind of guy. I think in the past lectures, you probably heard me say, I'd rather change your religion than change your diet. And the reason I say that for this situation is when we really look, really look at the incidence of adhesive capsulitis, it rises. 10 to 20 percent if you're type 2 diabetic, uh, 36 percent if you're type uh, type 2 diabetic. Um, so we see that a lot of these patients, uh, I'm sorry, that are on type 1 and type 2 as you see here. Um, however, um, 38 percent of, of, of men who have uh, diabetes and 24 percent of women who have diabetes um, have a, a signs and symptoms associated with adhesive capsulitis. So diabetics have more of these issues. The question is, is it truly a blood flow problem? And I think there's a component for that. 
But what we talked about with rotator cuff syndrome and really every other um, diagnosis is it's not the activities that people are doing. Your body is a self-healing organism, so your body is able to, to tolerate load and is able to get injured and then heal. There are some people who are not able to heal fast enough. So normally if we do an activity, we'll go through an inflammatory reaction, our body will heal and we'll move on. People with thyroid disease, people that um, have diabetes are unable to heal at the same rate. So these people are at an increased risk for developing uh, adhesive capsulitis because of their failure to heal. Uh, we all do dumb stuff to our bodies on a regular basis. Uh, the question uh, becomes, who can uh, recover from those? I took a look at my uh, my four year old who will be out on a scooter later on today, and he'll uh, he'll he'll run around a scooter. He'll skin his knee three times, and in a week you can't even tell it's already healed. If I fell, I'd, I'd cry for the next twenty four hours, and I'd still have a skin knee two weeks later. Uh, we just heal faster when we're younger. Now, when it comes to uh, adhesive capsulitis, uh, we're going to see this more frequently in female. And if you've had it on one side, chances are you're going to get it on the other side. There's a couple different reasons for that, but I think the main take home message to this is that this is not a primary localized lesion. This is a failure to heal response, failure to heal diagnosis. And uh, that's not one side versus the other. Uh, symptoms. Uh, sleep disturbances are common and this is usually more in the phase one, phase two stage where you're going to have inflammation. If you have inflammation, you have chemical irritation of any part of your body. When you sleep, you don't have other external uh, noises and sounds and pressures on your body. Your body is going to focus on those spots that are trying to heal or that are inflamed. So sleep disturbance is pretty common. The most common thing that I'll hear as far as an activity modification is your grooming and dressing. Just because you can't get your arm behind your back, you really can't do much at all with that arm, including doing your hair and those kind of things. Uh, so people will often need a little bit of help uh, with, with those normal uh, ADLs. Uh, when it comes into the evaluation, this is the, the piece that unfortunately I'm going to give you the, the most sensitive and specific test. And I can tell you right now that most people that I see in my practice are already in that frozen stage and you can't do anything to them. Um, but let's, let's work this person up as if you, you don't know if they have adhesive capsulitis to begin with. We need to figure out one, is it adhesive capsulitis? Um, or two, is it just something uh, like a typical shoulder pain where you have loss of internal rotation. So uh, one of the, the, the pathognomonic things that we see with uh, uh, adhesive capsulitis is external rotation. If you have a limitation of external rotation that is greater than 50% of the other side, then we have an issue. Uh, and this is normally measured with the arm in full or 90 degrees of abduction, and then the arm's gonna be in the frontal plane. Uh, so we really wanna make sure that we can uh, assess this. You can look at the uh, affected side versus the unaffected side. And if, uh, if you have a loss of 50% on that affected side, um, I'm really going to lean on to adhesive capsulitis type diagnosis. Uh, and this is passive range of motion. Um, this is not active range of motion. When you do things actively, um, then you can really, um, uh, you know, you're taking into account uh, neurogenic uh, or arthrogenic inhibition due to pain responses. Uh, when you're doing it passively, you're looking at pure joint motion and hesicapsulitis will affect the joint proper. Uh, internal rotation, a loss of internal rotation is Jeez, it's almost just normal when it comes to the shoulder. Uh, we see this, and I try to test this. I do this both lying down, both supine uh, for, the, for the shoulder. And the reason I do that when I'm worried about a capsule um, is that when you can lay someone down, you're really taking all those postural muscles and putting them at, at rest. Uh, so I think that that's a, a little bit better. When the shoulder is in abduction, uh, meaning it's way out here, you're really making the shoulder joint exponentially more unstable. So testing the joint with an abduction will really highlight capsular issues, which we've already seen with that, that past slide. You want to take them 45 degrees and then externally rotate them. Uh, but with whatever way you test them, make sure you test them on both sides, seated and laying down, uh, to really get a, a good grasp of what's going on. And I think that sometimes you'll see um, you know, passive ranges of motion that are lost, but it'll be in different ranges. So 
if you have passive, like, oh, it really hurts there, but then you're up here and oh, it's, it's just fine. Uh, I'm gonna lean more on a, uh, an external component, maybe a specific muscle, a specific ligament that's injured. When the capsule has synovitis and it's starting to develop fibrosis, it's everything. It doesn't matter what range of motion they're in. They can't get into those ranges. Uh, so something to think about. I think that whenever I look at this is, um, I look at uh, you know the, the actual diagnosis and I always try to have an idea of what else could be at play. If you had to look at frozen shoulder and if you don't think scapular dyskinesis is at play, then you missed the first couple of parts of this lecture. This is a continuum. We have a co-conspirator here, is that this is a whole line of dysfunction throughout the years that has led to a failure of healing response, a lot of it being musculoskeletal. So please, and this is one thing that I do with my patients, is not only do I, I once send them out for the, you know, the mobilization of the shoulder, which takes a half an hour, 45 minutes, three times a week, um, but I will still see that patient you know frequently once or twice a month that I'll be working on periscapular motion I'll be looking at controlling the scapula uh, to help them get uh, increase that arm elevation uh, and then of course uh, looking at the cervical and thoracic spine uh, manipulation of the cervical and thoracic spine it will help with that nerve sensitization downstream, uh, this being the shoulder. Um, so there is still a big part that we can play as chiropractors in alleviating symptoms even though the, the true um, you know, frozen joint is gonna take some time to go away, keeping these people comfortable, allowing them to sleep, giving them advice and reassurance will also be a valuable service that we can offer. Now, in the very beginning of treatment, uh, we're still gonna look at Hawkins-Kennedy test. Uh, if you haven't looked at the impingement syndrome lecture, uh, we went over this. However, normally be in front of the patient just for demonstration purposes or not. Uh, you can hold the elbow and bring the into rotation and look at, uh, you know, do they have uh, increase in pain? Normally be supporting her elbow at that point also. Uh, sorry, just an old video for this. Uh, this uh, this presentation. Uh, nearest test is going to be the exact same. We're looking at a passive approach to the shoulder. She's going to fully internal rotate her arm and I'm going to slowly bring her arm up um, into full flexion and uh, see if we can reproduce some of that pinching sensation and pain uh, in the subacromial space. When it comes to range of motion, um, I, I really will look at both sides because what we see with frozen shoulder is that once you have a problem on one side, normally you're going to have it also on the other side. Uh, so we could take a look at that uh, to see what the, the changes are because let's face it, uh, whereas 90 degrees of internal rotation is normal, um, they may not be that even on the unaffected side. So having a realistic goal to work towards will go a long way in, in helping, um, you know, getting that person back into their normal range of motion back into their normal life. As far as radiology, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to see synovitis. We're not going to be able to see a lot of the soft tissue, um, you know, considerations with frozen shoulder. However, you doing some radiographs will help uh, because we're going to see uh, it's very common to have osteoarthritic changes associated with that. Also, keep in mind is that as we have that thing last longer and longer, that constant compression, lack of motion is going to accelerate the degenerative process. So something else to think about that we really want to focus on getting this person out of pain uh, as quickly as possible. So when we get into the uh, the imaging, uh, while x-ray may not be the best option in there, we, we do want to focus on what we can visualize and what we can make an impact on. MRI really is appropriate when it comes to um, a frozen shoulder because of the duration and the cost and the time, the disability associated with frozen shoulder. We need to make sure there's nothing else going on. So MRI is appropriate to really rule out other causes of rotator cuff pathology. Normally our rotator cuff pathologies six weeks, maybe 12 weeks, and this thing should be knocked out. Um, with an MRI, we're going to see that there are certain things going on with an MRI that we need to be aware of. Myself, as a, is not a DAC bar by any means, uh, an actual radiologist is going to look for, you know, uh, problems with the axillary recess thickening, looking for that synovitis, looking for a ju uh, joint volume to be compressed and reduced. Um, and we're going to see thickening 
of the rotator cuff muscles. We're going to see proliferative synophytis around the capsule. Uh, so a lot of things that can be, uh, that be popular uh, with this kind of a diagnosis. Uh, but what we'll see with this uh, uh, shoulders, we'll often do an arthrogram, and we'll see with that arthrogram, we'll see diminished joint capsule uh, capacity, meaning that they're not having much fluid in there. And what we know from most joints is that that constant compression and motion will increase fluid within the joint, and they're just not getting it. The most common thing that I will see, once again, not a radiologist, but you'll see this axillary, or some people call it the subscapular recess or pouch, has diminished. And I think that's the next slide. Yeah. Um, so a normal axillary pouch is just gone. Uh, so part of that capsule is being compressed and due to that thickened, uh, you know, inferior glenar humeral ligament, um, we're starting to see that axillary pouch diminish in size. So things that we can look for uh, on an MRI to hopefully lead us in this right diagnosis. Now keep in mind, this is the thing that uh, will sometimes get people. Um, so the subscapularis, which is you know the inability to externally rotate at zero degrees, is one of the failures of diagnosis, meaning this isn't adhesive capsulitis, it's something else, just a rotator cuff problem. The second one, which I've been fooled on, and it's, it is often very uh, difficult to treat, um, is a cervical radiculopathy when they have pain right here. You know, we think of this pain, I don't want to move my arm, it hurts and it's, it's terrible. Uh, sometimes the pain's not from that location. So in that case, it's more of a cervical radicular pain, uh, we'll see um, a radiation to the deltoid tuberosity very common. The way that I do that in my practice is I'll use some orthopedic tests to kind of highlight that dysfunction. Things like the arm abduction sign. Now with a frozen shoulder case, they can't get their arm up to here, but I will say that passively, if you can get their arm up to here and rest it there and let them have be, be dead weight with that, um, and if that pain goes away, it gets better with that Reduction, uh, it usually leads me in a direction of more of a cervical type problem. Yes, you can do maximal foramenal compression test and see if that pain gets worse. Anything that's going to move the neck and uh, exacerbate uh, shoulder pain, uh, I'd want to I want to at least investigate the neck a little further. I also use the arm squeeze test, where you're going to create compression around the the arm, and if I put compression with about two to five pounds of force around the arm, and I exacerbate those symptoms, it's possibly due to compression of the nerves. If I squeeze down here and it reproduces pain up here, um, then, uh, then I'm thinking more of a cervical radicular pain. If I push here and it does nothing to my shoulder, my shoulder still hurts, then it's probably just more of a shoulder problem like an adhesive capsulitis. So what do I do for adhesive capsulitis? Uh, I think that the biggest piece of this is really understanding where the person falls in the continuum, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. And then uh, with those, with that diagnosis, it kind of can lead the methods, meet, um, you know, lead what I'm going to do to the patient because I know that I have to get things moving both actively and passively as fast as possible. Uh, and if I have a loss of range of motion, you know, isn't that 25 to 50% loss of internal rotation or external rotation, I need to get this moving better because if I don't, they're going to keep on going down that, that process of, of, of the, the joint freezing, essentially. Um, when we looked at the literature, and we do a lot of research. We have research papers delivered to us on a monthly basis in the hundreds. Uh, we'll go through the research when we're developing our uh, condition references. Uh, it, it's a couple month process. We have people who are diplomates in rehab and orthopedics and radiology and nutrition um, and neurology all give us this information. And I can tell you one thing that there is a very, very specific way to treat frozen shoulder. It's throw the kitchen sink at it. And I say that in jest, but there is no single intervention that's going to help every single person with adhesive capsulitis. There's just too many variables at play. And like I said, I am I'm, I think I'm fairly decent at treating some of the variables. I am not qualified to treat all the variables, meaning manual therapy for adhesive capsulitis shows varied outcomes. And when you look at the literature and the reason it shows varied outcomes is because the musculoskeletal component is only a piece of the puzzle. Manual therapy is great at improving range of motion, improving function, decreasing pain, 
but that's only one piece of the puzzle. Yeah, there's also papers that just so supervised neglect uh, will help these things flaw or, or thaw. Uh, it'll take a little bit longer of a time, but we don't need to entertain our patients with expensive uh, treatments and modalities. And I think that there's a piece of that puzzle, but uh, just like inflammatory arthropathies and diseases, is that people have cycles of, um, of different hormone profiles and nutritional profiles based on seasons uh, that can affect uh, the systemic response. Uh, also, working with the, uh, diabetics, working with thyroid disease, uh, there's a lot of other issues at play. So I'm only going to talk about the musculoskeletal component uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity and what we normally do. I think that when it comes to the uh, phase three and phase four, meaning it's not inflamed anymore, I need to get things moving. And I, what I do is I use a, an instrument system manipulation and I go through there and I rough it up. Now, I would of course use lotion, but just for the, this demonstration, I'd go along all the muscles, the supraspinatus, the teres minor, the infraspinatus, the subscapularis. I'd use a tool, I'd use my hands, I'd use a sledgehammer. I would get things moving, whatever is your soft tissue du jour, that's what you're going to want to do uh, and create an inflammatory response. You don't want to leave them bruised and aching and pain, but you need to start to get them moving. Uh, there's a lot of good research on instrument system manipulation to help dig in a little bit deeper and create a pro-inflammatory local response. We can also do mobilization. Now, mobilization. there's a lot of people who will do uh, mobilization type uh, diagnoses. Uh, let me turn this back on. Mobilization of the glenohumeral. There we go. Um, so glenohumeral mobilization will um, only be directed at the ranges of motion that are lost. So checking side to side, in this case, mostly uh, your flexion, your abduction, and your external rotation. And you really want to focus on just taking them to that range. And a lot of this is convincing the person they can get up into that range. So there's a psychological component that you're not going to hurt the person. And then once you get to those ranges, you are hitting a fibrotic block. Um, so don't think you can push through it. Uh, you're not going to push through that. Uh, but tissue does respond to stress. So repetitive motions, uh, stretching will help uh, increase the range of motion, but it will be slow. You're not going to see dramatic dramatic ranges um, within a treatment visit, but if you can marry what you're doing in your office psychologically and physically to their exercises, they can be doing those exercises throughout the day and it can really help make the soft tissue changes that are necessary to get these people out of pain. Um, I think this is a, a very understudied type um, treatment is working on the scapula. I do this on all of my uh, adhesive capsulitis patients. I work them into upward rotation. I work them into retraction, protraction, um, and I really just in every direction possible get everything else moving, meaning even the cervical and thoracic spine. Uh, so if you look at my right hand, I guess that's in this case, it's supporting the shoulder. It's a safe position for the shoulder and it feels good because they haven't moved that joint in a long time. So there's really no downside to mobilization of scapula. Clearly, you're not going to get manipulation. There's no pops or cracks or capsule when it comes to the scapular thoracic joint. However, this is a great way to get things moving, uh, at least start the process. When it comes to management, uh, this is uh, this is where I think uh, the gold comes in. You know, if I had to look at what I can do for somebody with adhesive capsulitis, I would say the number one piece is to teach them what they could be doing at home. There's a lot of things I can do for symptomatic um, uh, results with manipulation and, and scapular mobilization, but I think if we really want to look at how fast people recover, it's going to be more of how much work do they put into it. External rotation is number one loss of range of motion. I think a stretch like this is, is very valuable. What you're gonna do is use a wall to help keep a nice stable shoulder. So she's gonna stand next to a wall here. Uh, what she's gonna do is she's gonna put her hand up against the wall so she's not in any kind of external rotation or just as far as she can go. She's gonna push into the wall for seven seconds. And then you can see here, she's actually gonna use her body to slowly try to get more external rotation. Um, so it's a passive stretch. She doesn't have to move her shoulder at all. The shoulder is moving passively based on the position of her body. And with pushing, she's 
pushing, she's activating that subscapularis, and then relax, taking advantage of a little bit of neurogenic inhibition and getting some more range of motion. Uh, the more she can do this, in fact, a lot of my patients, uh, this is going to be a five to 10 type rep or, uh, a set uh, per day uh, kind of exercise. It might be a little uncomfortable. I do not want any of my pain, patients in sharp pain. However, I would also tell the patient this might be a tad uncomfortable. Pain up into a three or four out of 10 is okay. If it gets above that, if it causes peripheralization of symptoms, of course, we want to back off a little bit. Uh, working the shoulder into a normal range of motion. I think this is a big piece of it. The abduction, let's imagine her right arm is a shoulder that's, uh, that's frozen. She's using her left arm to assist her right arm. Now, she's not just passively pushing it up. She is really trying with her right arm here to go through abduction. It's the left arm that's going to nudge it just a little bit further to assist it as she goes up. And she's trying to regain that range of motion. So it's a combination of active and passive passive motion. The goal, of course, would be full active. She doesn't need the cane anymore, but when someone is symptomatic, they're going to need that cane to assist that motion to get that uh, full range. Uh, you can also do abduction and flexion with the cane in this position, where you're using them both to come up. Now, let's just take into consideration, this is possibly still her right arm that's affected. I still want her in her mind to be using her right arm to go through that range of motion. The left arm is just helping in that process. Um, so the same kind of deal, if she wanted to, she could hold the top of that cane and as she comes up, she'd come up higher, uh, just like you saw with the abduction, uh, just varies based on what the patient's comfortable doing. Um, from the prior lectures, um, hopefully you guys know that I, I'm kind of uh, indifferent on cognitive pendulum for most diagnoses, except for this one. Uh, this is one that cognitive pendulum exercise does go uh, hand in hand with the, uh, the treatment and, and the recovery of this patient. And I'll load them up pretty good. Uh, meaning I'm gonna use a weight or a milk jug, something that they already have in their house. And we're really gonna try to increase that range of motion uh, passively. And when you do that, when you're leaned over and your arm's up here, I mean, technically the arm is up here, so you can really uh, increase uh, that range of motion. You're stretching the capsule from all different directions in a passive motion. Uh, hopefully it's not painful. You can increase weight to distract that area and hopefully pull apart those joint surfaces, allow inhibition of, of fluids into that area. So I think there's a lot of positive things that, that come into uh, the cotton and pendulum exercise. Um, internal rotation is a little bit difficult and the reason is they just don't have it. Um, so yes, I think that performing internal rotation is, uh, is a benefit. I think that we should be doing that. However, I've never seen a uh, adhesive capsulized patient be able to do this. Instead, what they do is use the same cane that we did for the other exercises and now they'd be doing that with this exercise where the right hand will be holding the cane, left arm will be pulling it back and forth uh, behind the body. So still promoting internal rotation, uh, but also keeping in mind that a lot of people can't get into that range of motion to begin with. Uh, I am not a big fan of the cross body stretch when it comes to rotator cuff syndrome and impingement syndrome, just because it can cause a similar pain uh, because this is essentially a, a Hawkins-Kennedy test. But when it comes to adhesive capsulitis, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. This is a way to actually stretch out the external rotators and go a little bit further and you're pushing into your hand with your elbow, hold for seven seconds, relax, and go a little bit further. Um, we're just trying to get range of motion anywhere where we can get it with adhesive capsulitis. So the biggest thing is to focus on how to get things moving in a safe way. And the reason I say safe is because uh, these people have a uh, inflamed, a sore, a limited range of motion joint, uh, and they're a little bit nervous about it. It's been there for a long time. Nobody's giving them a clear answer on how long it's gonna to take to go away. It's up to us to be a voice of reason to say, all right, here's what's going on. It's, this is gonna take a while. We're gonna start off by being nice to it and resting it uh, and working on just on the scapula, working just on the cervical and thoracic spine. Uh, but once you hit phase three, it's no longer inflamed, uh, then we can focus on getting things mo moving. Personally, for me, even when they're in phase one and phase two, I'm going to do, be doing some scapular and glenohumeral range of motion as long as it doesn't cause sharp pain. And I'm also gonna be employing some 
some medical friends, some nutritional friends, um, some p other people that can help decrease the inflammatory response to hopefully uh, limit the amount of freezing they have. But keep in mind that if they're in that inflammatory process, they're they're in um, that uh, you know phase one, phase two area. I probably don't want to be taking an instrument and scraping that area because a lot of that's going to cause irritation and more inflammation, which I definitely uh, do not want to do as far as my patients. So at the very end of this, uh, with adhesive capsulitis, I think that we need to really uh, hammer home that this starts with scapular dyskinesis, it goes through impingement syndrome, rotator cuff syndrome. You can sprinkle in possible slap lesions, biceps lesions, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome in, uh, on the outset, but the end result is usually uh, adhesive capsulitis. Uh, we really need to make sure that we understand where this person falls within all these diagnoses and also understand that when you're treating the shoulder, sometimes you are peeling back an onion. Sometimes they have seen multiple practitioners and it's our job to decipher uh, not only what's happened to them, but what's happening right now. Uh, where, do this, where does this person fit in the continuum and how can we treat it most effectively?